Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Chasson, and I'm a planner at the, I'm an urban designer at the planning department. And welcome to our virtual community workshop for the Minitoma Art Corridor Project. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick overview and talk about what's going to happen today. Um, and then we'll, we can go from there. Um, we're really glad that you came. We thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes, giving you some pro project context. We're then going to hand it over to Joseph Becker and from the MoMA and Jill Matten from the Art San Francisco Arts Commission, who will talk about the curatorial part process and the artist selection process. Um, then um, the, our landscape architecture team will present some conceptual streetscape designs, and then we want to hear from you and get feedback. There'll be a quick wrap up um, at one o'clock so we can end on time. Just as a note, we've reserved the meeting. We've blocked off the meeting for an hour and a half, so if there's a lot of Q and A. Folks, we were happy to stay until 12 um, or 1.30. Um, and then kind of also before we kind of start the actual presentation, just want to ask, um, can explain how this process is going to work today. Um, if you would just please bear with us, you know, at the, we're all sort of adjusting to the new reality of COVID-19 and shelter in place. And um, we'd obviously wish we were there with you in person, but it's not safe to, to be there. And um, so, and I know at the planning department and throughout across the city, we're all kind of pivoting and trying to figure out how this new world of digital only outreach and virtual outreach um, works and, and it's kind of a new tool for us. So I think we've got the kinks worked out, but hopefully it'll, it'll be good. And then just so how it's actually gonna work is we have some moderators um, from our team that will be moderating the chat. So if at any point during the presentation, you have any questions, um, please just write them in the chat and we'd like to save those questions till the end of the presentation for a Q&A session. Um, and, and the moderators will either call on you or if there's big themes they might, that come up, we'll ask the questions. At the end of the first two presentations, if there's sort of clarifying questions that we can answer quickly, they may, well, the moderators will just, will just ask those for you. And we've also created a feedback form and there's a, you should see a link to the feedback form at the top of the chat. Um, and it's kind of an opportunity for you to let us know maybe in a more kind of narrative way what you think about the design and how you think about this process today. Um, you know, we, one option is you could open it in the browser tab and fill it out as, as the meeting progresses or you can fill it out afterwards, but we'd really appreciate if you would fill out, take the time to fill out the form. And then finally, we're going to be scheduling over the course of the summer. Um, we realize this is more of a one-way conversation that we'd like because of the medium that we're using. Um, and we are offering to schedule small follow-up meetings or one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. If you have more kind of nuanced feedback you'd like to give us for the design, or you could, you know, folks that should be here and, and couldn't, wasn't, weren't able to be here today, we're happy to schedule a follow-up with you or your organization as needed. Um, finally, I just want to throw out to my colleague, Julie. We've got a lot of little bits of information we want to get to you. If I forget any of them, like, please feel free to chime in and, and, and supplement my presentation. Thanks, Paul. And then um, I also just want to kind of acknowledge that, you know, this is a very strange moment that we're in, kind of, you know, we were all plugging away and working on our streetscape project and excited to roll it out to you. And then all of a sudden COVID-19 hit and we're sheltering in place. And then um, and that was a hugely disruptive event, I think for everyone. And then compounded with that sort of the uneven impacts of the Pandemic, pandemic coupled with the recent killing of George Floyd and others have surfaced issues that have sparked kind of a much needed conversation related to structural inequalities in our society kind of across the culture. And we know that many folks in this neighborhood have been impacted by these events. And at the neighborhood scale, we also know that many businesses and cultural institutions are sort of struggling to pivot and adjust to this kind of new reality on the ground. And we, I just want to let folks know that the city is working urgently on numerous recovery projects. In fact, in the decade or so that I've been with the city, I have never seen the bureaucracy mobilize as quickly and nimbly and with as much alacrity as, as it has in response to this crisis. Um, but in this case, you know, we're working on a project where we have money in hand and the city is legally obligated to spend these funds in the street. So, if you're wondering maybe why are we still doing this project, if this is the highest priority right now, I think that you know, they, these infrastructure projects are moving forward in parallel with the city's response to COVID. And um, you know, we also think there's an opportunity to, for this project to help address 
address this broader cultural moment that we're going through. And we recognize saying that, that we're not gonna solve the pandemic or, or certainly not gonna solve structural inequality through a streetscape project. However, because of the, the deep integration with art and into the bones of the project, this is an art first project, um, that we think that it kind of lends it uh, an opportunity to kind of engage in that cultural dialogue in a way that a typical streetscape or infrastructure project couldn't. And we know that we have a responsibility to do that um, in, in all the projects we do to sort of advance equity and, 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 and become a part of the recovery. So this project has a chance to support artists through infrastructure development. We have stated goals um, in the project about prioritizing diversity among artists, elevating typically underrepresented voices in the public art process, and that's just a start. We really look forward to hearing from you all in the Q&A and the chat about how we, if you have ideas for how we can sort of, you know, further these goals, which are really important to the team working on the project. And with that, I'll sort of move into the kind of the context and the bones of the presentation. Um, you know, this is, like, as I mentioned, this is an art first project. And we, we, unlike most projects where we sort of do a streetscape project and there's a 2% for the arts that kind of gets tacked onto the end, we try to lead, we've really sought to lead with the art. Um, you know, though the art, we want to end up with an art and landscape architecture really integrated into one seamless experience and have deep integration but with the two sort of sides of the design coin. Um, and to sort of mobilize and, and, and organize ourselves around that, we, the team has created what we, uh, Project Charter, what we call a commitment to collaborate, where all of our organizations have, have signed this document or, are, or have written this document, we're about to sign it, and to articulate how we work together, it has project goals and so forth. Um, we've also worked together our curatorial team, which is composed of the MoMA's curatorial staff, SF MoMA's curatorial staff, and the SF Arts Commission have drafted a curatorial statement which will guide the curatorial process, the artist selection process, and establishes curatorial goals. And these documents will sort of result in physical manifestations of like in the of infrastructure, there'll be streetscape designs that'll result in a built, tangible like 3D built, built street. And there'll be as, as well as um, integrated and standalone art installations throughout the corridor. I wanna take a moment to introduce our partners. Um, on the community side, we are working with the SF MoMA and the Yerba Buena Community Benefit District. We are thrilled to have strong partners on this organization. And I know for our partners, like I said, this has been a really um, challenging transition. And we really, at the, all of us at the city, really appreciate your sticking with this project during what has been, I, we understand, a, a difficult time for your organization. Um, on the city side, you're joined with the planning department. We're um, playing kind of a convening role. The Arts Commission, who is working to manage our public art process. Public Works will be leading the streetscape design with MTA um, leading the traffic engineering. Um, and um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about our overarching project goals and, and the, you'll hear more about the curatorial goals at the, in their presentation following. Um, but broadly speaking, we wanna execute world-class art and we wanna leverage this project to elevate underrepresented artists, integrate strong use of color in the landscape, inspire, delight, and engage, um, create a sense of civic pride, activate and enliven, enhance public safety and accessibility, and create gateway features that sort of join these two key neighborhoods in our city. Um, just some background about how we got here. This project grew out of a planning process, which is hopefully winding up soon. I should, I think my supervisor is on the call, and I promise I've been leading this plan. I keep promising I will finish it. Um, but the project is kind of in the upper left corner. You can see our streets and this, the, this is part of a broader planning process called the South Downtown Design and Activation Plan, where we're looking at the streets and public spaces in the around the Transit Center and Rincon Hill. Um, kind of zooming in on our site, you can see um, the Transit Center over here, the new kind of cathedral to public transit and mobility in the region. Yerba Buena Gardens over here and the SF MoMA. We've really kind of are trying to anchor and link these three major civic nodes in, in the neighborhood. And then it's not just about the MoMA and Yerba Buena, there are numerous institutions and organizations. There's a, this neighborhood has a rich density of cultural institutions. And so this, we're sort of helping define and mark this, this place as an art center in our city. Um, this really briefly, the site has really well, is very easily accessible. Here's a map showing the existing and proposed protected bicycle network in the neighborhood. 
And here's a map showing all the transit in the neighborhood. You can see there's obviously with the transit center and on Market Street on Mission Street, got really great transit access. So it will be, be visible to a lot of people. Um, in terms of timing, you know, we came to you about a year ago where we had a kickoff meeting at the MoMA. Um, over the past year, like I said, we've been finalizing our partnership, pivoting to the new reality in the post-COVID-19 era, and we've developed these design concepts, as you'll see in a minute. Um, today, we're gonna present these conceptual designs to you. And as I mentioned, in this, over the summer, we're gonna be having ongoing community feedback. Um, we, once again, I wanna plug my, our, our feedback form. We'd really appreciate if folks would do that. And if you have questions, and at any time throughout the presentation about the process or the art or the, or the design, please post them in the chat. Um, and then moving forward, we have about a year or so of design and, and then another year to bid and construct the project. And hopefully in spring 2022, just in time for a COVID-19 vaccine, we can all meet mask-free in the alley and have a launch party um, in Austin. And so with that, um, I'm, that kind of concludes my presentation. I'm gonna hand it over to our curatorial team, but before I do, um, Julie and Sienna, have there been any questions about process that have surfaced in the chat? No, no questions yet in the chat. So I think we could just move on to the next section. Great, well then I'd like to introduce Joseph Becker from the SF MoMA and um, Jill Matten from the San Francisco Arts Commission. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Share my screen here. Yes, thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, well, welcome everyone and greetings. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Joseph and I will walk you through the curatorial framework. Um, we start with the underli underlying belief that artists bring a unique perspective to design. And with that in mind, we just we aspire to transform the MINA Natoma Corridor into a vibrant and original art destination by integrating the artist designs into the actual streetscape. Um, this will occur in concert with a number of standalone inter artistic interventions that may happen in a second phase that would be executed on adjacent public and private properties. And I, I'd like to add that I think this project, besides Paul mentioning that the funding is in place and the city has a strong commitment. I feel that we are very well positioned to succeed. Um, there's a, a wonderful spirit of cooperation and shared vision among all of the parties. And that's not always the case with city projects. So that we're, we're very excited to have this moment in time. So um, here, this is an image Paul showed you. You can see the overview of Minna and Natoma from Trans Bay to uh, the museum and uh, beyond. Uh, next slide, Joseph. Sorry, Jill, there we go. Okay, thank you. And then here's, um, here's a, a typical view of Minna Street looking towards Trans Bay and then from Trans Bay towards, towards the museum and Yerba Buena Gardens. Next. And similarly, um, Natoma Street, you can see the museum's facade and the long vertical window. And then again, looking from the museum to Trans Bay on the right. So um, imagine the transformation. Um, next, okay, Joseph. I just want to second um, Jill's optimism here for so many different entities to come together for this project is really uplifting, especially at this moment. Uh, and so we're thrilled that we've been able to continue to work on this project. And uh, from my perspective, as a curator at SF MoMA, it's a wonderful opportunity to reimagine um, the adjacent pedestrian areas uh, and to make Minna and Natoma a, a real destination on their own. So you see that the museum in, in the two images on the left was really designed with an eye towards the city. Uh, this very tall window that spans multiple floors uh, is really thought of as kind of a community space inside the museum. And the view out towards Natoma Street really has been leaving something to be desired, I think. So this is just a wonderful opportunity to continue the goals set forward with the museum's expansion. Um, and so in this project, I think Jill can tell us a little bit more about some of the goals that we've outlined. 
Yeah, so as I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, we really want to create a unique visual identity for Minna and Natoma. And we are going to actually get the artist involved in the design process. So it won't be in a it won't be something that's added to the streetscape. It'll be integrated into the streetscape. And that might include paving design, lighting design, um, working with the landscape architect um, for, to integrate ideas into their work and wayfinding signage. And um, we, we really believe we can transform this corridor into a hidden gem pedestrian destination that um, will bring people to and from Trans Bay and Yerba Buena Gardens in SF MoMA and through the uh, passageway between Howard and Natoma adjacent to SF MoMA. So as, as Paul mentioned um, in his introductory comments, it's really important for us to prioritize that there be diversity among the artists. And we're looking to elevate typically underrepresented voices in public art projects and have identified the kind of projects that, um, that we think will be right for these opportunities. Um, ultimately, though, we hope the uh, program is ongoing and, um, and will allow for a periodic rotation of artwork pending the availability of funding. And um, it, we wish to engage artists of local, national, and international renown that um, will respond to the site-specific needs and opportunities. And also from an urban design perspective, we're looking to maintain visual cohesion within the neighborhood um, by having this seamless integration of art into the streetscape and surrounding context. And our goals um, align with and support various goals and um, implementation strategies that we found in the South downtown, downtown Design and Activation Plan, the Transit Center District Plan, SF MoMA's Expansion Plan, and um, YBCBD Street Life Plan. So um, I believe we're, as I said, we're poised for success. So we have a number of uh, ideas that we've been thinking about and um, Jill can mention the Julie Chang project that's at kind of one end of this Minna Natoma Art Corridor and we'll go through what we imagine um, the core of the first tier part of the project and then mention part of the second tier. Yeah, so I hope many of you or, or all of you have seen this wonderful um, floor in the Grand Hall of the uh, Salesforce Transit Center. It was done by local artist Chula Chang, who lived south of Market at the time she was selected and had recently just graduated from college. And the floor is based upon, she, it's only her design. I, the arch, it wasn't even a collaboration, really. Uh, the architects fell in love with her idea. It's based, it basically incorporates the flora and fauna of the state of California and a number of hidden um, surprises and cultural overlays that refer to the demographics of our Bay Area population. She worked with a local firm, um, Associated Chirazzo. It was just a seamless collaboration. And um, so this is a, a good example of artist design incorporated into paving. And, and that's really kind of one of the main parts of this project that we're imagining. And we've identified a few other examples that, that we're using as reference. Um, but really what this streetscape improvement budget allows us to do is to imagine a rework of the paving uh, yeah. and potentially the sidewalks as uh, essentially a canvas for an artist. So some things that we've been looking at are um, Copa Cabana with Roberto Borle Marx, um, or Carlos Cruz Diaz's recent work at the Broad Art Museum in Los Angeles on Grand Avenue. Um, and there are, there are multiple um, different techniques that we're imagining. So we're really studying what type of intervention it can be from paving um, to concrete to paint, uh, different types of asphalt treatments. Um, Works like the Superkillen and Bjarke Engels group designs for the pedestrian core in Copenhagen have been really inspiring and their integration not only with uh, treatment of the horizontal surface but how that can potentially integrate 
into the vertical surfaces, as you see kind of in the upper left here. Mm -hmm. And works, you know, with artists that we've always been fond of, like Barbara Stoffaker Solomon, um, and Musée Sassé. I should just add to Joseph's comment, those are Musée and Barbara, and the next artist, um, Joseph Schilling, are all local artists as well. Yeah, and our, our goal, and these are really just examples, you know, Jill and I have been working uh, together with some of our colleagues on a long list. Um, and part of the process here is that we're imagining inviting a selection of artists to create proposals. So by no means are these definitive artists, just examples to kind of um, engage in today's conversation. So aside from uh, paving interventions, we're also imagining the potential for sculptural bollards um, with some ideas here from Woody de Othello and Anthony Gormley, Pedro Reyes, and Mildred Howard. Um, and some lighting potential as well. Yes, yeah, so on the left we have the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium. This is a project by an artist named Joseph Kosuth, and it really does transform what was um, a very understated uh, facade of the building. It activates it and it beautifies it and provides illumination and makes it even a safer pedestrian walkway. And then um, we have the Annie Alley project on the right by Hank Willis Thomas, Love Over Rules which was um, commissioned by Sites Unseen. But again, that really brightens the alley. It trans it's like a moment of surprise and delight. And then here, um, examples of artist gateways. We're thinking about gateways at the intersection of the alley and Second Street. Here's an example from the 80s on the left by R.M. Fisher at Battery Park City in New York. I believe this also incorporates illumination. And then on the right, while well, the sculpture by Alicia Kwade, which is shown on the uh, rooftop of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, was not necessarily intended as a gateway. Joseph and I thought it had gateway potential. So again, these are just e examples of how artists' works might align with what we're doing, but not the specific works that would be commissioned. And a work by Walter Hood as well, recent um, project at the Hunters Point Shipyard, potentially evoking a, a kind of gateway. So that um, these, these engagements are really what we're considering the first tier, which is um, supported financially by the plan um, for the streetscape improvement. But as part of this Minnetoma Art Corridor, we're imagining a second secondary phase, which is really about partnerships within the community um, and establishing um, a continuation of this art program onto walls, potentially for murals, um, which would have you know, separate sources of funding that are still under consideration. So I just wanted to put a slide here of some examples in, in this corridor where we could imagine other artworks. And, you know, to give a, a further example, SF MoMA is really um, looking intently on the surfaces uh, outside the museum that are on the museum property as spaces for ongoing um, collaborations with artists and murals. And, and this is something that we're imagining would be um, potentially rotating, um, obviously depending on funding, but um, that we're really hoping to engage in these vertical surfaces um, as much as what we're, we're thinking about for the streetscape. And so one image to really plant perhaps as, as, a, as an idea is this work by Susan O'Malley um, on the parking garage wall. A photoshopped image here. So that kind of takes us through our curatorial presentation, um, just giving some some thoughts and some some visuals to what we've been working on.
I don't know if we want to pause here or continue on. We haven't, um, yeah, Joseph, we haven't, again, we haven't had any um, questions in the chat yet. So I think we could pass the baton over to Public Works to get going on the street design, and then we can pause for questions at the end. But again, if anyone has questions in the meantime, feel free to put them in the chat. Excellent. Hello, this is uh, Lawrence Cuevas with Public Works Landscape Architecture. I'll be presenting the streetscape conceptual designs. I'm also joined here by Danielle Chan, who's part of the design team, as well as John Dennis, also a landscape architect, and Denny Fan, who is the Public Works project manager for this project. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Is this uh, visible to everyone? Looks good. Yeah, it looks good to me, Lawrence. Okay. I think if others can see. Got a couple. Is it on full screen mode or? Um... No. N no, it's not. Okay, there you go. There you go, that's even better. Thank you. All right, um, so just going to start a little bit with, uh, you know, again, a little project context and background. Um, it's always useful to sort of look again at high level um, of how this project really connects the Transbay Transit Center, which is how, you know, millions of people will be arriving to San Francisco, as well as these major, you know, very highly visited institutions such as MoMA, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Yerba Buena Gardens, and Moscone. Um, so we can see that these two alleys really have the potential to be sort of the first impression that people have of San Francisco. Also, if you look at the urban form of this neighborhood, Mo, uh, Soma is generally characterized by long blocks, wide streets. And so these two alleys are really an opportunity to create an intimate sort of pedestrian human scale network of um, kind of safe routes. You'll also be able to note that New Montgomery at these two alleys currently don't have east-west crosswalks um, linking those blocks of Nina and Natoma. Um, so those are, those are sort of the, the things that we'd like to prioritize with these projects, as well as, of course, the integration of public art. Um, and on that note, some photos of just kind of walking around the neighborhood, something that you'll notice that in addition to being home to the most museums and galleries in the city, this neighborhood also is characterized by an abundance of high quality public art and public open spaces. Um, you can actually see again, uh, the work by Julie Chang at Transbay, um, as well as work by Sites Unseen, as, um, and also the, the connection of the views between MoMA and Natoma Alley itself. And to better understand the, the two sites or the, the two alleys, we, in our first community meeting, we invited the public and stakeholders to really give us sort of their you know, everyday knowledge about, you know, these two alleys, everything from specific issues and, you know, certain crosswalks um, to art opportunities. And so we've summarized that here. I realize it's going to be really hard to read, um, but some of the highlights include specific locations where people suggested things like bulb outs, um, have talked about the necessity for loading, um, and also noted, you know, certain parking spots can create hiding spots. Um, or it, uh, kind of block visibility. Uh, so we've definitely taken all of this feedback to note um, as we've developed our designs. In addition to that feedback, we've also worked closely with MTA to understand how the current parking, loading, and circulation occurs in these blocks. Um, one of the goals of the project is definitely to maintain as much loading as possible, understanding that this is really critical to the local businesses and institutions of the area, and that they could also be used in a flexible way for things like um, uh, food trucks. Uh, we are looking at uh, eliminating the individual car and motorcycle parking spots where needed um, to, to allow us to have some of these um, kind of different uh, infrastructure improvements, which are what I will go over next. So I'm just going to go through some images of kind of the strategies and design elements that we are proposing for the project. 
starting with infrastructure. And these are really more about the sorts of changes that we can make to the roadway and the sidewalks themselves. Um, things like raised crosswalks to, pedest uh, to prioritize pedestrian safety and con traffic, as well as signalized crossings and sidewalk widening. Um, sidewalk widening, if we are able to remove parking, we can replace that space with more sidewalk space to allow just better pedestrian circulation and safety, as well as allowing um, space for elements like planting, or furnishings, which we are unable to really do in the current sidewalk configurations given their limited uh, width and also sub sidewalk conflicts, sub sidewalk basement conflicts. And of course, we want to make sure that there is adequate um, street and pedestrian lighting in these alleys to ensure that they're safe and inviting. And again, preserving loading is one of our priorities. On top of that layer of just making sure that these streets function are safe and are maintainable, you know, we really want to make sure that we are incorporating public art um, as well as other placemaking opportunities to make these spaces not, you know, really inviting, inspiring, and comfortable, um, really recognizing that this could be a great network for the neighborhood um, that invites pedestrians, gets really kind of the, the foot track that going and benefiting the the adjacent institutions and businesses. So some examples include street greening, uh, furnishings. These are images of Yerba Buena CBD's um, custom benches and bike racks, which were done in coordination with artists, as well as bollards, which are pretty prevalent in these alleys, opportunities for interpretive signage, wayfinding, and sculptural elements. And then really one of the biggest opportunities we see for improving these alleys are, um, is sort of the, the paving of the roadway itself. It's kind of the biggest blank canvas that we can imagine. And we're really excited about the opportunity to elevate the alleys by you know, making them more than just standard asphalt alleys. This will do two things. It'll invite people in, it'll create an inspiring environment, but it'll also slow down traffic because they will see that this is you know, a, a special sort of space um, and I think pedestrians will be able to feel more comfortable you know crossing the street and you know walking more safely with these sorts of treatments. So on the top we have sort of high contrasted banding um, between different shades of gray. This already exists within the neighborhood. The example on the right is the Natoma block that's been completed recently at Trans Bay um, and the image on the left is the granite um, paving at on the top of Salesforce. We also see this sort of banded pattern in other areas of the neighborhood, including Yerba Buena Lane in front of the Contemporary Jewish Museum. Um, so we think that using this sort of design will help tie uh, these two alleys into the greater identity of the neighborhood. On the bottom, as Joseph and Jill mentioned, there's also a really exciting opportunity to treat the roadway as a canvas. Um, here are some different ideas for pavement murals in addition to what has already been showed. And this can, of course, be coordinated with designs for decorative crosswalks. Um, Yerba Buena Center, or Yerba Buena CBD um, has already kind of been working on proposals for crosswalks. So this is definitely in line with the kind of work that's been done in the neighborhood. And finally, we're showing some examples of accent lighting. Um, we want to make sure that just as a baseline, the project provides adequate lighting for um, pedestrian and traffic safety, which was covered in the infrastructure opportunities. But you can really see that lighting has the, the power to transform these spaces and really kind of call attention to the interesting architecture of the area, um, potentially highlight things like planting um, and the roadway, um, and just generally make the space much more inviting and kind of uh, you know, interesting from a pedestrian perspective. And so from there, we are just going to go jump directly into the conceptual design for these two alleys. First, we're going to look at the overall plan. I know this might be a little bit hard to read. So at this scale, I'm just going to go over sort of the major um, infrastructure changes. Um, and of course, you know, this is really recognizing that the conditions and uses on MINA and Atoma do vary. Um, but we're as much as possible trying to tie them together to feel like they're related. Um, on kind of just starting with MINA, um, we are prioritizing creating raised crosswalks at the alley entrances and exits um, just to, you know, really kind of make them more pedestrian friendly and uh, accessible. Um, we've also found an opportunity on New Montgomery at both MINA and Atoma to enhance 
the, the connection by um, adding new signalized crosswalks here. This is something that, you know, right now people kind of have to take their, you know, take their chances even if they're trying to cross at these areas, even though it feels like an intuitive desirable crossing. So this project hopes to really formalize that, those crossings and make them safe through new signals and crosswalks. Um, and also taking the opportunity to, to really celebrate that new connection um, and create these gateways um, by bulbing out onto New Montgomery. So by bulbing out, we are able to create more space for pedestrian circulation as well as for placemaking elements and art opportunities. Um, on MINA, we found that there's generally a lot of loading um, and because of that and our priority to um, save loading and preserve it, we aren't able to do too much sidewalk widening. So on MENA, we're really concentrating our improvements, our infrastructure changes to the alley ends, really focusing on the idea that the entrances to the alley are an opportunity to invite people in and that people naturally stop at the intersections. And so by concentrating our improvements there, we're really sort of putting, um, kind of strategically imaging, making these changes at spots where they can be most utilized by people. Um, throughout the entire alley though, we are proposing uh, repaving the surface of the roadway with nicer elements or nicer, nicer paving materials, which here we're showing the banded concrete paving um, with granite uh, accents on either side. Um, on Natoma, we found that there is less parking in general um, and less loading. So we are able to remove, um, remove parking spots to allow us to have sidewalk widenings on these blocks. So in addition to those raised crosswalks and the raised and the kind of alley gateway, we're also able to, again, strategically widen the sidewalk, which allows us to have, um, have room for things like new street tree plantings, new bollards or furnishings. And after, um, I'll, I'll go into each of these uh, alleys in a little more detail, zooming in. Um, so starting with MINA. So on the bottom, you can see the plan um, of MINA between 3rd Street and New Montgomery more closely, um, as well as on the top right, you can see an image of generally what that sort of alley gateway would look like. Um, so we've bulbed out onto New Montgomery we've added this crosswalk. There's actually another crosswalk um, in the most current plans proposed here. Um, so we'll have two new pedestrian connections east-west across New Montgomery, protected by signals and marked by new crosswalks. Um, and here you can see the raised crosswalk um, across MENA, which provides a much more seamless connection for pedestrians and slows traffic moving through this space. We also are able to narrow the, the roadway um, within this area to really focus only on the space needed for vehicles to move through. And we've created a flush condition throughout this entire area. So this, this, this alley gateway seeks to create sort of a little bit of a mini pedestrian plaza. Um, on the left, you can see the, what that widening looks like within this space. We're able to widen a little bit, you know, three feet on I, either side, but it does give us room to add things like lights or sculptural elements in this area. And here is just a rendering of what that could look like. Again, none of these, um, you know, we have a, an image of a sculpture here, but none of these pieces have been commissioned or designed really. Um, these elements are just shown as placeholders to give you an idea of the scale, how they could work within the space um, and kind of the opportunity they, they have to invite people in. So on the left is the existing, the right is the proposed. And then moving on to Natoma, um, here we are able to do sidewalk widening. Uh, that is kind of just shown very simply on the top right corner. Um, and so we're really excited about that in terms of the opportunity to create infrastructure changes much more consistently across the length of the two alleys, not just at the two entrances. Um, so here we're also showing, of course, that new potential for a paving mural, treating the entire roadway as the canvas um, and coordinating that with the elements in these, uh, in these widened sidewalks. So, you know, perhaps the, the different bollards or interpretive signage or benches could coordinate with the design of the paving mural or could be designed by artists themselves. Again, this is the new pedestrian connection across New Montgomery. 
um, two crosswalks with, uh, with traffic signals, kind of controlling the, the flow of traffic and pedestrians. Um, and then another thing we're showing here is a proposal uh, that potentially the entire sort of west end of Natoma, um, kind of right at the doorstep of MoMA or at the entrance of their garage could become a shared street. Um, I think based on the traffic circulation here and the generally lower flow of traffic and lower speeds here, this could also become all flush. Um, again, creating a space that could be used for activation, um, but also just generally making it easier for, for pedestrians to make the connection to MoMA um, and this alley, which leads to Howard. This is a shot of Natoma between New Montgomery and 2nd Street, looking west towards MoMA. Um, and again, you know, kind of just a, an example of how that sidewalk widening can really allow us to have elements that really start to give the space a sense of place um, and also comfort, interest, and also more just more space for people um, to kind of walk and potentially, you know, pull aside, find their way, orient themselves. And then the last rendering, um, this is kind of, I think, really highlighting what's so exciting about this project is the idea that really um, by treating this project, this infrastructure as an opportunity for art and really putting that at the forefront, we're able to incorporate it in a seamless way that can then be layered on top of um, so you can see on the existing slide, this is kind of what it looks like now. The proposed streetscape has the potential to really sort of illuminate this space and kind of highlight that connection between Transbay and MoMA. And then it also gives, you know, a really unique opportunity to see the streetscape and to see the part of the public art on the streetscape from a unique perspective. Um, and I think that's really exciting. And finally, on the right, you can see how the streetscape can also, you know, work really well and in coordination with efforts to create public art or publicly visible art on private property. And so I think, you know, you can really see how it all starts to come together. And that, the, that's the end of my slides. So. Great. I, thank, thank you, you so much. Lawrence. Oh yeah, go ahead, Paul. I was going to, I think, did the same thing. As thank you, thank you, Lawrence. Maybe we should start into the um, the Q and A now. Julie and Sienna, were there? Do you want us? Maybe we can give us some questions from the chat. Sure. I think you know we had some items that we were able to resolve kind of as the chat was going on. So thanks to everyone who is kind of piping in. Um, to uh, one issue that was raised earlier on that I just didn't want to lose sight of is, you know, Roger raised a question about maintenance and stewardship and just sort of how all these new and beautiful things will be cared for. So if someone on the team wants to speak to that, um, that would be one, one item to start us off. I'm happy to take a crack at that. Maybe folks feel free to chime in and supplement. Um, so we have some strong language in our, so we're, it's a little hard to have a, to really answer that question, because we don't quite know what the project is yet. We don't have the artists on board. These designs are conceptual and so forth. That said, we have, we have some really strong language about a strong needing to have a strong maintenance plan in place before we put anything out in the right of way. And so the way that will work and in, in kind of technically is the commitment to collaborate document says that you know, before, uh, later on in the process, when we know what the art and the, the project is, we're gonna all develop a maintenance strategy. And I think the likely outcome is it's gonna be a shared maintenance strategy. And um, we're trying to be very clever about the way we fold art into the streetscape design. So like an art can design, um, an artist can design a paving pattern, for example, that public works can maintain and, and install as opposed to having a special contract to do that. Um, we also have the community benefit district, which also does maintenance above and beyond what the city can do and sort of has maintain other art. And then I think we will be working with both the CBD and the MoMA and the Arts Commission as we're designing these, these projects. Think about how they can be, how maintenance can be built into the designs themselves. That's, those are some of the early thoughts we have on maintenance. Great. And Paul, just to clarify, to catch another couple questions, 
Um, is it accurate to say that, you know, the maintenance plan you're talking about would definitely address uh, street painting if that were uh, the method that was used for decorative elements and that you might even get into the details, for example, of how like kind of the service elements of the alley, like trash, compost cans, et cetera, you know, making sure there's space for those things so they can coexist. Is that accurate that the maintenance yeah, plan would address those things? I mean, it can even, even get into the design of the art saying, oh, hey, here's a, they're working with the CBD who, works a lot with, with maintenance and, and knows about has maintenance, you know, we can say, they, they can say, rec we recommend you coat it with this special anti-graffiti coating to make it easier for us to clean and, and so forth. So we try to integrate it in, in all parts of the design. But for sure, street trash cans and so forth, making that, that can be made. Okay, great. So thanks, yeah, thanks for kind of answering that. We captured a, a couple of comments there about maintenance and stewardship. Um, and I think we had some questions coming up about the kind of mid-block crossings, but I, I also feel like some of those have been um, answered in the chat if people are following that. So um, thanks to those who've kind of answered that throughout. I don't know, um, MTA, do you want to speak briefly about, um, you know, your comment about um, the potential pedestrian scramble and other items just to kind of address the circulation comments that were coming through? Somebody from Public Works or MTA who might want to chime in on that. Hi everybody, this is Denny, Public Works Manager. Um, I'm not sure if MTA is on, on the line, but um, I, I did check in with them yesterday and part of the intent is at these mid-block crossings um, is to have a dedicated signal for pedestrians. So we'll be able to create a pedestrian scramble. Um, pedestrians would have their own dedicated signal and would be crossing um, and that would remove the conflict with vehicles. And so once the pedestrian signal is over, then you would have um, vehicle signal that would be able to flush traffic out of um, the alleyways. Um, so that's right now what they're evaluating. Um, it's not set in stone, but that's the, the current proposal. Um, there was a comment that um, MTAs had some reservations on the block crossings on New Montgomery in the past. Um, they have confirmed that they are looking to have the signal at MENA, um, and they're currently looking um, and evaluating the need at um, the Toma right now. And I, I would also just add to that, that when we, in our conversations with MTA, they were saying that, that the car movements coming out of the alleys and merging onto like New Montgomery, those cars would not see a green light, but instead would see a flashing red light. And so they would still, because pedestrians often will jaywalk across an alley, even if there's a red light for them. And so the cars will sort of treat it like a stop sign if they have the, the, the ability to go at all. Okay, um, if we feel like that's complete, I might just field a couple more questions that are coming through. Does that work? Um, we had one question about uh, just the kind of the process of funding uh, for the project, just sort of how, you know, Paul, you spoke to that a little bit at the beginning, but if we could address that. And then I have a secondary um, question after that about um, the art selection process. So let's start with the funding first, and then we can go to the next one. Okay, um, so we're sort of picturing this in two sort of tiers. There's a city streetscape project, and that'll cover the, the public right away, the streets and the sidewalks and everything kind of between the property lines. Um, and that's, that's, we have, I think about $6 million that includes the mid-block crossings, and that funding is in hand. And like I said, that funding was generated from impact fee revenues after new towers were built around the transit center, and the city is legally obligated to spend that on a streetscape project. Um, we also recognize that there's a great opportunity here to leverage private property and private funding to kind of augment this project. And so we're not, we can't spend city funds on private property, but um, the hope is that we can sort of leverage the city money to find additional funds and willing property owners that we can sort of have the artwork and the, the project crawl up the sides of the buildings. And I would add that it doesn't all have to happen at once, you know, like, yeah, I think in the landscape art, the last slide in the landscape architecture presentation, we might start with the streetscape project and then incrementally over time augment it. And so part of the idea behind the curatorial process is that the curatorial team would sort of make themselves available kind of indefinitely to other streets, to property owners who might want to add to the project as, as it becomes feasible for them. 
great. And I think, Paul, just jumping off that, um, I just want to make a plug that in the feedback form that we have, uh, which we'll post the link of again in just a second, it's an opportunity if, if you on your property, you know, want to partner on a project to indicate that to us. And so I think some people have mentioned that in the chat, but um, if you can help us as well through the feedback form by indicating that, that's really helpful. Yeah, and, and I would add that, you know, I know we heard from one property owner on that, the, the 111 Minute Gallery at, after the first workshop a year ago, and I think we were probably not ready to receive that that kind of request, but I think we're in a much better position to kind of respond to it now that where we are in the design process. Great. I see Michelle giving us a thumbs up. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so I have one other question theme that's emerging, um, and this is just about our integration and the artist selection process. So Joseph and Jill, if I could ask you to Good. tell us um, a little more information, just I think you highlighted it slightly, but just about the selection process. Um, and then, you know, uh, we had a comment, I think, from Jeffrey that was interesting, which kind of said not only selecting, you know, diverse artists and being inclusive in terms of artists, but trying to make sure um, that it's also diverse and inclusive art. So maybe if you could speak to that, those two points a little bit, um, that would be great. So first about the, about the process, um, Jill and I have drafted our curatorial vision statement, which is really kind of a, a series of um, guideposts for, for the process. And we're at the point now where we're really evaluating how we can utilize the budget and, and what kind of projects we can really take on. And the process moving forward for artist selection is um, we're working with creating an artist shortlist. Uh, and then we would be inviting a, a selection of artists to uh, propose their interventions. And those would be um, supported with honorarium for the artists. Uh, so, so at this point, we're still really imagining what we can do. I don't think that we'll have the budget to really do everything, um, you know, a gate, a bollard, a, a paving intervention, all of these things at once. So we're, we're currently really trying to figure out how um, large of a project we can go and how many artists we can have involved. And then to the second point, I don't know, Jill, if you want to add to that. Um, yeah, oh, I'd like to. Yeah, go uh ahead. Oh, well, I should also add that we will be working in concert with um, the city team and the community, we, um, the Yerba Buena CBD and members of the public as well, which is part of the city standard process. Um, the ultimate decisions would be made just like if it were an art commission only project, the ultimate decision would be made by the arts commission. And in this case, it'll be made by SFMOMA and the arts commission, but I do want to underscore that the participation of the public as well as our city um, design partners are, are an integral part of the process. And I also envision, or we've discussed that when the proposals are submitted, there'd be some uh, public forum, some way to share those with the community and gain input. And I think that could be very exciting. Hopefully we don't have to do that over Zoom, but um, We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see where we are in the world when we get the proposals in. And then to the second question about diversity in artists and diversity in art, that is absolutely our intention. Um, although Jeffrey, I believe you asked that, and I'm curious a little bit more what you mean by diversity in art work. Can I talk, or do I have to type it yeah. in? Uh, of course. Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, what I mean is that um, I think that a lot of art, I, I have concerns about the way public spaces are being developed and um, the way the types of art that is palatable to sort of a larger public and um, uh, commercial, I don't know, uh, context that kind of softens sort of what I see going on in the country right now. And I just, I think that we as designers and business owners and curators have to take the initiative to be pushing not just inclusiveness, but the actual content that comes with inclusiveness. And that the art, could, could some of the art be challenging to people that are there? Not, um, I'm not talking about, you know, you know, outrageous, you know, or obscene art, but 
doesn't have to be soft art or, or what we're calling now like a smooth landscape where it's um, the edge is taken out of it. You know, could, could you have, and I, I'm thinking about even just the color palette of the painted, painted streets. I think that color communicates something. If it was painted in Pan-African colors, that would communicate something to everybody about what those colors mean. And that the kind of pastel, and I don't mean this as a, um, to be a negative criticism, but to me, it reminds me of like um, the Museum of Ice Cream, which is sort of a, the happy place. And I just wonder, I, I feel like each of the components from a design point of view need to be thought through in terms of what they communicate, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And I'm, I do feel like in art, as we see all these statues being torn down and all this other stuff, that um, that, that art represents all of the communities of the city uh, in whatever way is possible. I realize there's complex processes at work, but that's kind of what I was getting at. And, and I would just like to see it not be a, a, an art shrouded gentrification of the alleys, but something that's really, that's meaningful to the, yes. to the people that come to visit. Jeffrey, you, you raise a very important point, and this is something that we are absolutely taking very seriously. Um, so um, I, I thank you for your comment, and I have no intention of making um, any decisions uh, prioritizing soft art. I think that there really is an opportunity for um, this corridor to be provocative. Great. I want to just pause the conversation here for a second and just acknowledge it's, it's one o'clock. And so, like I said, we have um, reserved another half an hour of time. And um, but I want to give folks the opportunity to leave if they're if, if they need to be somewhere. Um, I just want to before we do that, just thank everyone on the team. I'm not going to go through all the names, but I do want to give a shout out to John Dennis, um, who's a senior landscape architect at the at Public Works and um, he just announced that he is retiring um, at the end of July, and I can tell you that the folks in the urban design group at the planning department um, were, are both very happy for you, but we're really sad to see you go. We've always thought of you as a great ally. John casts a long shadow. He's had his fingers in numerous projects, super high profile projects like Federal Market Street, the Castro Park Project, and countless others, and so we just want to wish you the best, John, in your retirement. Thank um, you, Paul. Thank you so much. And then also before you go, I want to give one more plug for our feedback form. Um, and, and so, like I said, we're happy to stay and continue to do the Q&A. And John, we're, we're going to miss you. Thanks. Likewise. <laughs> Thanks. And Paul, if people do want to stay for continuing questions, we're open to that, right? Yes. We have a few we're more I could kind of around take until through. at least, I think the meeting ends in a half an hour, but we have, well, we're, here to answer your questions. Okay, so just a question, you know, we were, we were kind of going back and forth about Hunt, um, you know, which is Hunt Lane, it's the little segment. And, um, you know, I think we as a team have talked about that being as part of the project, although it may not be as much of a focus in some of the designs. So we had a stakeholder with a question about that. So I just wanted to confirm from the team that we are kind of looking at Hunt Lane um, as we look at the, the study area. I can yes, take I that. That we would like to include Hunt in our um, project because of its important linkage to, we want to maximize pedestrian connections and uh, especially there in front of the MoMA. But um, it is uh, pr actually private property. So um, it's sort of, a, uh, will be looked at through a different lens and um, needs to be um, approved by that property owner rather than it, uh, the city. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, we also had a question about um, if, you know, something like a, a living wall or kind of that kind of hybrid between greening and art um, would be considered as part of the project. So I don't know if that's more of an art folks question or um, others, I think kind of probably depends where it would be if it's on, you know, a private property, then that that would have to kind of come through those types of partnerships. But if anyone wants to speak to that. Um, that was another question that came through. I can offer some thoughts on that if it's appropriate as a, as a sort of a member of the community. Just sure. Separate yeah. Myself from the project team now and just share something. So I think many of you know SF MoMA manages a, a large living wall 
And uh, one thing I will share is that there's a real complexity to maintaining and yeah, keeping a living organism like that vibrant in public space. And, you know, you imagine you place California natives on a wall and they get the natural moisture from our environment and are vibrant forever. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, it takes a huge amount of effort to cultivate that kind of a space. And you, you should really think of it more like a form of agriculture, actually. Um, and so when we introduce those types of elements, which are, which are beautiful, they require a tremendous amount of maintenance and support and care and also um, investment in infrastructure. Um, so, you know, I think what the city has been able to do for all of my years in the city is really work on a great um, urban forest um, platform. Uh, if you look at the intersection, I think, at Trans Bay and 2nd, They've done these uh, lovely curveless streets and they have these elevated beds where they have plantings. I could see something like that being a logical solution, but the living walls, again, I think they really require a private property sponsorship in order to be successful. And I'm just offering that as somebody, again, that, that uh, gardens vertically on a daily basis at the museum. Thank you, Noah. That's really helpful context as well. Yeah, um, and I, I'd like to just comment on, on in response to that. I don't see that as an art project, an art undertaking, because of the high maintenance, uh, ongoing and high level of maintenance required. So I would think that would be something that could be done uh, by the private mm -hmm. property owner. Okay, and I just want to say too to people, um, you know, it's been really helpful to use the chat because we've been able to sort of group similar themed questions. Um, but if people do want to raise their hand and just kind of chime in or say something, um, we can do that. If, if the line gets unmanageable, we could go back to chat and try to go by themes. But, um, you know, if people, I think we've gotten through a lot of the themes now. So if anybody does want to say something, um, you can raise your hand. Yeah, this is Mike Petrinka from the Academy of Art. Uh, just wondering, will you be sending out something for a process for us to share with our department directors and artists on, on how they could support and, and work uh, with the with this project? Um, yes, I you know I don't we I know we haven't quite gotten to that level of detail yet. I think I think what we will do as a start is. Um, Post a project website. Um, I can I can send you to this planning department south downtown the soda planning website for now, and we'll post our materials up there. And then I think the best way for you to get in touch with us is um, through the chat form, and we can make sure that that website has some materials that that kind of give an overview of what the project is. Yeah, the street has a lot of meaning to us. You know, we have one of our we have our largest building on that on the Toma in, in New Montgomery. And uh, we would like to definitely have our students, in particular, you know, provide input in, in their art. Jeff McLean's on the on the call here. He he he's the department director for that department, and and we would just like to see if we could submit some ideas. Um, Jill, I think you're muted. Yeah, of, of course. Um, we're, we're just not at that point yet, but um, there will be some announcement made to the community um, when, when we're seeking submissions. But um, the Academy of Art could also commission more artwork for its own building facade um, as a way to support and further activate the uh, Natoma streetscape. And um, I think it would be great if you guys did that. So I we have a grant. That's it. Yeah, we have a grant in right now with your in a Buena CBD for uh, for uh, that. And and I would add that, like like I mentioned earlier, I think the hope is that you know we're creating an a long an ongoing art corridor here. This isn't a one off project, but it'll have a longer life, and there might be rotating temporary art. And so the idea is that the Arts Commission in the moment might continue to offer curatorial services to organizations so that we can sort of make sure we have a unified sort of space but or or if people feel like they want that expertise that that's a resource available to anyone thank you i'll add one thing that i want to thank jeff for uh 
having his students help us take a look at these two alleys uh, early on in the project it helped us to um, understand um, all the parameters involved in these two um, small but mighty alleys. Yeah, well, I would say thank you for um, allowing the students to, um, you know, access to the information and, and, and doing it. And also, I just want to say congratulations, John, and um, what a loss for the city. So happy for you. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> You're going to be missed, I am sure. Paul, Julie, may, may I say something? I'm, I'm having it. I'm not sure if I'm able to raise my hand. I'm not finding that button in my computer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just so everybody knows, I think if you go down to participants, I think um, you can click on the bottom of your screen and then there's an option to raise hand. But right now we don't have a cue. So Noah, we'd be glad to have you uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I'm just thinking about what, what Mike said, and I think some of Jeffrey's input, which I think are really sort of excellent source of input. And um, I think Joseph highlighted this a little bit in thinking about the, the phasing or the tiers of opportunity intervention. Obviously, one is the type of intervention which is happening through the, the process, the armature of the project itself, which will result in art objects and public space transformation. But another piece of this is uh, the, the private properties, the, the private individuals that um, are adjacent to the project that can really contribute. Um, you know, I think Joseph highlighted a little bit how SFMOMA is thinking about engaging with the project through our own parcel. And I think as, as Mike, um, is, as you point out, the Academy has this gorgeous building with a frontage on two prominent alleyways. You've already programmed that space and to see that kind of programming continue in conversation with the overall project is a really exciting notion. Um, and certainly, Jeffrey, your efforts to inform some of the landscape design efforts has been really important and informative. And the only reason I bring this up is because I think a secondary feature of these conversations with the community is to hopefully inspire others to come together and contribute to the greater project. I, you know, we're we're in a really unusual and fortunate uh, circumstance where the city has proactively identified a source of funds and come to us and said, work together, let's inspire something incredible in this space. Um, these opportunities don't come very often. And I think collectively as a Yerba Buena group and those stakeholders on Mina and Natoma, we have a real opportunity and responsibility to engage in this. Um, and so I'm really encouraged that as this project moves along, you know, with, with support like you, Mike, and many others who are on the call, we can really program this entire area and make it a destination. And I think, Paul, when you started, you said, you know, this is an infrastructure project. And I think it's interesting in many ways, it's an infrastructure project, but it's become so much more than that. And Paul had a vision of saying, you know, let's take this infrastructure project, let's make it something spectacular, let's bring in the CBD, let's bring in our partners, let's look at a core creative group and the Arts Commission and my colleagues in Curatorial and aspire to do something which models for the city a way of working. And I, I don't know that we've brought that up here, but the other thing that we're all witnessing right now is a, is a model of working in the city which happens in rare instances that should happen more and more frequently particularly now moving forward. Multiple departments working together in untested ways, looking at removing obstacles, engaging the community for input and in projects that doesn't typically happen in this way and working really rapidly. Um, and if we can collectively be successful in this, we do have a way, we have an opportunity to transform the way this city engages and, and frankly our common spaces. And, and then I'll, I'm gonna say one last thing and I'm gonna get off the podium here which is that I think now more than ever, perhaps, we need to have really broad, big, transformative types of projects that land in the city streets. And as this pandemic passes and we get the vaccine, and I love Paul's optimism here, um, we are going to want to engage in our public spaces in ways that we haven't before. You know, we're already seeing the evolution towards an evolving public realm space with expanded cafes on streets and expanded parklets and the rapid removal of parking lanes and the addition of, you know, um, 
transit options that are in the public space, we know that this is going to be something that could be a long-term lasting positive effect in the community. And more than ever, um, projects like this, which are made successful by community partners, will be important in creating this um, new vision for the city fabric that I think we all are, are really eager to have and will be incredibly important for us in the future. So I just wanted to get those few words out and, um, and then I'd be remiss if I didn't also share in um, my sadness isn't the right term, but I've had the opportunity of sharing a seat on a board with John Dennis now for, for a couple of years. And I know many of the members of that uh, committee that we sit on are on this call. And he's been just a tremendous force. He is subtle, he is quiet, and yet he brings tremendous power. So John, we will miss you. Um, and I don't know if you're getting out of here, but like I said at the last meeting, we're going to figure out more and more ways to draw you back in because we need people like you in our community. So congratulations to you. Thank you, Noah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noah. Um, we don't have anybody else waiting to ask a question. So if anybody wants to speak up or say something, you're up. Okay, and we maybe got kind of have gotten through. So, you know, um, if that's the case, uh, you know, we've got the kind of feedback form as a chance for people to flag again for us if you have something really specific to your property or a really great idea or a partnership idea um, you want to share, please do it. Um, and just, you know, thanks to everybody who participated. And um, Paul, I want to hand it over to you if there's anything else to wrap up. Um, no, I think I think we're good. I just want to. I thank everyone for coming. I want to thank our partners again, you know, having done enough of these types of projects, these projects really hinge on strong partnerships and where we have a lot of expertise that greatly eclipses that of any individual member. And so we're so thrilled to be here today working with you. And I can tell you, this is like the funnest thing I get to do with the city. And so I just really appreciate the community and everyone coming out today and listening to us. And if you, want a presentation or, or you think that there's someone that, that should get to see this, we're happy to come and meet with you one-on-one -on -one or in a smaller group. Thank you.